What's going on guys, it's Simo. So today I'm bringing to you my top five competitive rogue decks for the September 2019 format. It is an incredible time to be a rogue player because there are so many different decks and strategies that are now so affordable, thanks to in part to the 2019 Megatons, but it's incredible too because the format is so vastly diverse. Sure, you've got your top meta decks like your Sky Strikers, your Salomon Greats, your Endymions, your Thunder Dragons, but it doesn't mean you have to play any of those decks if you want to see competitive success. Today I'm gonna be bringing to you five decks that actually not only have been getting one top but multiple tops at higher tiers of competitive play that are all very viable options for you guys to try out if you really don't like playing to the meta and if you want to play something a little bit different. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. Kicking things off with number five, we have a deck that I thought was just going to be a one hit wonder but actually has managed to sustain its impact in the current metagame and that's Gren Maju de Aiza OTK. Yes, the deck from YCS Portland that got second place piloted by Yishan McNabb has actually managed to make its mark on this format. And I'm completely shocked by this. I was expecting that deck to do one good just one time and that was going to be it. But no, there have been multiple higher tier events where this deck has been getting people invites, making the top eight. Like, that's insane. And why is that? Well, this deck has a very unique style of playing that honestly does a lot of really interesting and unique things. So one of the interesting things about how this deck functions is that it's a blind second strategy, which means you're always going to be going second regardless of whether or not you win or lose the die roll in that game one. And if given the option, you're always going to go second in games two and three. And the reason for that is because it doesn't matter if your opponent sets up any crazy combo board, your deck is designed to break those boards with all the good going second cards that are in the game. Stuff like Super Polarization and all these different things. And you're trying to just one shot your opponent with a single copy of Grand Mod you to Aiza. What's cool is, yes, he was playing at YCS Portland, all these different cool cards that we've never seen really see a lot of play. We've seen Golden Castle in small amounts, but never something like Hex Trude. I mean, that's such a cool innovation, but there's even been builds of Gren Maju that are more stun oriented or not even playing the Golden Castle cards, but are playing more traditional anti-meta tech. So this proves that this deck is adaptable depending on the way you like to play it. And honestly, it is a bit of a gimmick. I won't lie but the fact that it's still seeing this amount of success even several weeks after YCS Portland at multiple different events, I went ahead and gave it my number five slot. But coming in at number four, we have a deck that always manages to solidify a spot on this list, True Draco. And I know what you guys might be thinking, oh, True Draco, that's been around forever. I don't know what you're talking about. And yeah, it has been around forever and it may not be one of the best decks, but honestly, it's a very solid rogue contender because people don't go into a tournament expecting to play True True Draco. There's always that lingering threat that True Draco might be around, but you don't always go up against it. And that's one of the reasons why it makes for a very strong rogue deck, because even with all the other diverse decks that you could play, True Draco still manages to come out on top many different times. It manages to top the PPT in Orlando this past weekend. It's managed to top several regionals in the past few weeks, and it just has a really lot of good things going for it. I mean, it's consistent. You can play tons of draw power. The deck has so much built-in removal in the the form of the true Draco spells and traps. The monsters are big. You can play floodgates. There's just so many advantages that this deck has, and a lot of people really like the deck for that reason. And also, frankly, it's really fucking cheap. Like, this is one of the cheapest decks that you can build and play at a competitive level because you don't need an extra deck. Pretty much every card in the deck has been reprinted at least once, making the price of these cards come down significantly and making it very affordable for anyone to pick up. Also, the deck is very simple. Some of these combo decks might be a little bit ridiculous and complicated for some players to play, Draco has a very linear game plan, and that means that there's going to be less room for error, so when you're going over the course of an 8, 9, 10 round tournament, that means you're going to see more consistent success with a deck like this. So, for those reasons, I had to give Draco the number 4 slot, because honestly, it really deserves it. Now, coming in at number 3, we have another control style deck that has a lot of similarities to True Draco, but has its own distinct play style, Guru Control. And Guru Control's actually been seeing a large amount of success at the higher tiers of competitive play as well. I mean, we've seen it all over the place at the past large events. We've seen it winning regionals and getting top cut placements at regionals. It got a uh, top eight, I believe, at the PPT in Orlando this past weekend, and it's able to compete with the top meta contenders.
contenders. When it comes to Guru Control compared to other decks, like let's say even something like True Draco, Guru Control can play a similar Floodgate lineup. You have your own built-in engine being Guru itself, being able to search cards like Subterra Fiendus, which is a hand trap that can negate basically anything. So that's pretty damn good. You can search stuff like Umastrix, which can banish cards. Even though there's a bit of a slower play style in the fact that the cards need to be set, when you have cards like Hidden City, which is a very, very powerful and underrated field spell, it's a very solid deck all around. And yeah, it's not a cheap deck by any means. And just because it's a rogue deck doesn't mean it's going to be cheap. I mean, this deck plays three copies of Extravagance, three copies of Phantasme, and a majority of lists. So you have to be very committed if you want to play a deck like this, but the deck has a lot of very good strengths. I mean, if you have a built-in Book of Moon in your main boss monster, which can honestly just shit on so many different things in the meta because with Link summoning not being able to use set monsters, it's effectively a form of removal because it's setting the card and then it won't be able to have any of its built-in protections. There's a lot of very strong advantages to Guru. Yeah, it's a very slow deck and honestly that can be its downfall sometimes in a format where Sky Striker is the best deck of the format, but honestly, it's been able to consistently perform and that's why I gave Guru Control my number three slot. But coming in at number two, we have a deck that somehow got better from being hit on the last Forbidden and Limited list, which is completely contradictory to what you might think to be true, but it's Altergeist. Yeah, it's funny that with one multi-faker now, which is the deck's key card, the card that basically brings the whole deck together, only being at one copy, now it's seeing more success than it's seen in like the last six months. And yeah, obviously it's due in part to the way the format has shaped up, but the fact that we're seeing Altergeist making huge placements at YCS and UDS level events, it's winning regionals, it's won like several regionals over the past couple of weeks, and also made top cut at several regionals as well. This is a deck you definitely should not underestimate. This deck has so many good things going for it, and I think it's due in part to a few reasons. First off, the fact that the meta has shaped up to be kind of just all over the place. I think Altergeist kind of thrives in this sort of environment where people don't exactly know what they might be going up to play against. Yeah, sure, you're going to be going up against your top meta contenders, but when you suddenly find yourself sitting across from an Altergeist player, you might just be completely taken off guard, and you might not be prepared for that matchup. I think that's also a reason is that in players' side decks, they're choosing choosing to forego cards that might be very strong against your Altergeist matchup in more favor of cards against the combo decks and the more established control decks being stuff like Sky Striker and Salomon Great in their respective ways. So the thing is, if you don't have the adequate tools to deal with Altergeist, it can just absolutely obliterate you because of the fact it can just snowball advantage so easily, especially if it can get to its single copy of Multifaker. And there's many ways to do so. You've got stuff like Mel Seek, you've got Sangen going into All Mirage. There's a lot of easy ways to get there, but even so, you're still playing plenty of trap cards and with Red Reboot definitely in a decline right now and people more fixated on the combo oriented decks especially with the Megatons now being released side decking cards like Nibiru and Dark Ruler no more which realistically do nothing against Altergeist then this is going to be a very solid deck that you might not want to face because if you do and you're not prepared for it it could end your tournament career so for those reasons and based off the track record I had to give Altergeist my number two slot now before we get to my number one deck I did have one honor mention and that's Necroz and the reason for that is yes it did make a top 16 placement at YCS Portland pre Megatons before we got Nibiru and Dark Ruler no more but the thing is we haven't really seen it do too much ever since then however I think Necroz is a highly highly underrated road deck because it just has so many powerful tools and if it's piloted by the correct player I definitely think this deck can go very far there's so many advantages that this deck has being able to do stuff like drop Vanity's Ruler which is absolutely destroyed destroys the combo decks from being able to play. You've got Necroz of Unicorn, which is effectively like an onboard skill drain. Like that's insane. Trishula can just be ripping apart boards and Brianak can be shuffling monsters from the extra deck away. Like there's just so many powerful cards that this deck has at its disposal. And it seems to be getting better and better with each ban list we get because we seem to get like one piece back after another. And soon enough, it might be back at full power. Definitely don't underestimate this deck because it could be something that catches you off off guard. I wouldn't anticipate you're going to see one if you go to any major competitive event, but it is something just to be mindful of. But that's going to bring us to my number one competitive rogue deck of the September 2019 format. And if you haven't already figured it out, I'm going with Cyber Dragons because this deck 100% deserves it. Cyber Dragons have been on the rise lately, and yes, while they haven't solidified themselves in the metagame, this is a threat that is definitely emerging because Cyber Dragons in a meta where you have tons of combo-oriented decks that are just spamming the board and you can easily break them 
apart with Cyber Dragon's ability to go into stuff like Mega Fleet or just in a format that's dominated by Orcus, which all just happen to be machines, this is an environment where Cyber Dragon can thrive. Not to mention with Sky Striker being the best deck of the format, again, in my opinion, you have Cyber Dragons, which have an incredible matchup against Sky Striker because you can just contact fuse any of their Sky Striker Ace monsters away, and you don't have to worry about something like Triggering Ray or worrying about anything else that they can do to you. It just has an incredible matchup in that regard, but also when you incorporate the Orcus engine into this deck, it just takes it to an entirely new level. We're starting to see a lot of the higher level players experiment with this deck, and we're seeing them see massive amounts of success. We've got stuff like Blair Hunter, who's won like, or not one, but like topped like three regionals in a row playing this deck. We've got other players in California winning regionals left and right. The deck is definitely on the rise, and soon enough could be a solid tier two, maybe even tier one contender if the meta shapes up to be so. I think this deck is highly, highly underrated at the moment, and it has so much potential because even if you're going first, you can just do your full Orcus combo backed by a Cyber Dragon Infinity that can protect you from getting hit by Nibiru, and then you have your Orcus Crescendo to protect you from Dark Ruler No More, like so you don't have to worry about those cards. And if you lose the die roll and go second, you're playing Cyber Dragon cards, which are just designed inherently to break apart any board. The deck just seems so good, brimming with so much potential, and that's why I had to give it my number one slot. But guys, those are just my thoughts. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think about your top competitive rogue decks for the September 2019 format. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. So guys, thank you so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. Because just by showing your support in any way that you can, you're investing in my ability to continue bringing you amazing Yu-Gi-Oh! content. So thanks so much again, and we'll see you next time.